I'm Audrey Marshall, your Work-Based Learning Coordinator. With us today are Amy Hanna, our awesome career coach, and Dr. Asim Ali, who is with Auburn University. He will be our guest speaker today, and he is going to present to us um, information on careers in IT. Also joining us today is Mrs. Decker's uh, Python, Intro to Python class, and they will be asking some questions at the end after Dr. Ali's presentation. And I think we've got another visitor on there, our PR guy for the city schools, Daniel Chesser. So with that, I'm not going to keep talking a lot. We're going to let Dr. Ali um, go ahead and give us a little background about himself and talk to us about these wonderful opportunities in IT. Good morning to all of you. Give me just a moment. I'm going to get this started up. And uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to come by and speak with you today. I want to talk with you about um, technology majors and careers, which means, uh, you know, we'll get a chance to learn about emerging technology careers, what what to go about in terms of study choices. Uh, and then I want to do a quick little fun activity with you guys to help you identify your hidden algorithmic talents. Uh, and so um, just a little bit about myself. I grew up in Auburn. I actually graduated from Auburn High School, what's now the junior high, I suppose. Uh, so uh, that's been not that long ago. Uh, it was at the beginning of the century. And uh, and so it's only about 20 years ago. Uh, I graduated from Auburn High, decided to go to Auburn University uh, for, uh, I started as a pre-med major, but any, I decided switching over to uh, software engineering. So I graduated with a degree in software engineering and uh, and then started working on this in, in the IT field, started running my own consulting um, business around town with small businesses uh, and uh, and then eventually got my master's in information systems management. It's a little bit, uh, it's technical management essentially. And then uh, recently, uh, a couple of years ago, finished my PhD in adult education, also from Auburn University. So I've worked at the university in different roles now for 16 years. I currently work as the executive director of what we call the Biggio Center, but essentially I, um, I have an excellent team uh, that I manage of about 90 folks who work with faculty um, with how they teach uh, and uh, improving their overall uh, teaching, as well as making their lives easier by helping them design online courses or conduct testing for their classes. Uh, our past year with the pandemic response has been probably the busiest year for our unit ever uh, and uh, with lots of long hours. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's about problem solving and a technical career essentially comes down to um, problem solving. And so any opportunity you get uh, to work on problem solving skills uh, is going to get you ready for any career, especially those in the technical field. So the first thing to know is that there's not one way of doing a career in technology. There are lots of choices. Any, you know, there's what people call wires and pliers, where literally people are working with wires and pliers to make sure that the wires are connected like they need to be. And it goes all the way from that to management, to design and all kinds of creative uh, jobs. Um, so I want to go through some of them. The first thing I really want you to understand is for your choice, there is no escaping uh, understanding and appreciating technology. And I realized that WebEx detects when I put my hands together that I'm clapping. So yes, I'm I'm clapping. I don't know if you noticed that, but uh, so uh, <laughs> it's just kind of funny. Uh, so it's important to know that there are uh, that there are technology careers everywhere. So if you're saying, you know what, I'm just going to move to Coleman, Alabama, and be a farmer. Well, you know, if you're going to buy John Deere equipment, they all work on GPS uh, and they're programmed to do certain things. If you want to work in healthcare, there's technology involved. If you want to work, in fact, uh, healthcare technology is one of the fastest growing areas in terms of technology use. Um, you know, with the, with the mega trend of sustainability and uh, focus on, you know, responding to climate change. Uh, it is going to take technology solutions for us to make the leaps and bounds of changes that we need. Transportation, all of you guys are familiar with certainly things like Tesla, but you know there's lots of other emerging areas in terms of self-driving cars and all kinds of things. Um, so you know, just if you look at the list, regardless of what you pick, regardless of what you want your future to be, 
your competitive advantage will be if you have a comfort and an awareness and an understanding of technology. So, um, so the key to understand there is that uh, you don't want to uh, have an attitude about technology that says, oh, I'm going to stay away from it, but try to embrace it whenever you have an opportunity to do so. So I'm just going to go down a list of a few careers. You're welcome to uh, ask questions, and I'll certainly make time for answering questions towards the end as well. Um, you know, I'd like to start with some of the, the earlier, one, uh, some of the faster growing areas. So cloud engineer, uh, you know, as we shift, uh, continue to shift um, in, in commerce and in organizations and businesses from having data, what's called like on site, like so there's a server you know, there used to be a server in your classroom, which had data that you needed, but then it changed to the idea of having data in the cloud. As long as you've got an internet connection, you can access that data. And so uh, cloud engineers are in very short supply and in very huge demand. Um, certainly for advancement in the field, a college degree is useful and helpful. Um, but, you know, starting out uh, something as simple as a certificate uh, is actually, there's such a demand. Just even right now, there are about a thousand jobs open with Amazon in the Atlanta area. Um, Microsoft Azure and Google Cloud are also, you know, some of the fastest growing um, services. So cloud engineer uh, is, a, is a huge area. Um, Network architects, what they do is if you think about the high school that you sit in, uh, you know, you are walking around the high school and you don't want to lose a Wi-Fi on your device, for example, uh, or maybe uh, you are sitting, I don't know if you're allowed to use devices in high school, but your secret device that you're not allowed to have that needs Wi-Fi uh, that you're not allowed to connect to needs, uh, so a building like the high school would need uh, you know, security settings, for example, or even how do you install network access in a building with multiple different buildings and, and a campus like the high school. So uh, network architects are the ones who design those kinds of solutions. Uh, and that again, certificates and college degrees are typically what's looked for, uh, for people to, um, to be able to do the network design. It could start as some, something as simple as if you are thinking about your home, maybe there's what are called dead spots in your home, right? Like if you sit in a particular chair in a particular part of the house, there's no internet connectivity. Well, how do you fix that? How do you place, maybe, you know, if, if you look at going from one router in the house to a mesh Wi-Fi network, you know, how does that help you gain better connectivity for your house? You know, what if you want to be able to watch a YouTube video while you're sitting in the backyard? Um, those kinds of solutions would be a small way to start thinking about that problem solving uh, that grows into network architecture. Um, so Scrum Masters or Project Managers, uh, I've got a brother-in-law who does this for the uh, USAA, which is the, uh, which is the um, bank and banking services, financial services um, uh, for military families. And uh, essentially what, what it is, is uh, anytime that there's a major change needed that has to do with technical or software or any, any kind of major change needed, there is a method to how that change happens so that things don't mess up. Right. And so scrum masters or project managers use the different strategies for how to know what change is needed and how to go about managing a team to make that change. Um, and, you know, there is a tremendous shortage of people who have technical aptitude, but then also have an ability to manage people uh, according to the policies and the procedures that are set in, 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 in these kinds of processes. Um, a security analyst, you guys hear a lot about just security, 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 and uh, you'll hear even more about it. And the reason for that is that, you know, there's just the amount of data that we have about us is just exploding, right? So think about when you go to Kroger uh, or you go, to, you know, your parents go to Kroger and then buy something. What does it ask them? Hey, if you want an extra, you know, dollar off of those eggs, go ahead and put in a phone number, right? And if you put in your own phone number, then it's knowing who you are. Uh, that's your personally identifiable information. If you go to buy uh, gas, right, at a gas station, and you swipe that credit card and it says, oh, what's your, what's your zip code? And your initial thought is, oh, that's good. It's keeping me secure by making sure that I know the zip code, right, that I'm, that I'm swiping with the credit card. 
And that's true. It is trying to make sure that, you know, it's your credit card by at least making one check of your of your zip code. But, you know, uh, there are data systems out there that are called like, you know, the like the that are basically consumer tracking systems um, that companies can subscribe to that have hundreds and hundreds of data points for every single human that that lives in the United States or abroad. Right. Especially in the United States. So what happens is if I have the last four digits of a credit card number and the zip code, then I know who that person is. Essentially, I have a profile of that person and I can match it to uh, databases that exist that track, you know, does this person own a boat? Does this person what's this person's annual income and all those kinds of things? And so uh, th then that gas station can sell information about you. Right? Oh, it looks like they buy gas that every you know two weeks and it's premium so they get a they get a general idea of how much you're driving and what kind of vehicle you're driving uh, and so all of that data is tracked about you the more and more data that exists about us we're thinking about our medical records and all those kinds of things there's a greater need for security because if that data gets out which it does and then you get a letter in the mail that says hey we'll give you some free credit monitoring We've got to get better as a society about how we respond to security challenges that we face. Um, and so this is where security analysts come in. You know, power companies, if somebody hacks into a power company, then we're all out of power for a week or so. And then that would really have a tremendous impact on our economy. So that's why these jobs are actually that salary probably needs to be updated just because of the tremendous increase uh in, in those so the average salary is 90 but i mean i've i've had um folks recently uh, on campus that have graduated and had twenty thousand dollars signing bonuses and make about 120 to 180 a year so uh, after a few years in the business and getting some certificates and security um mobile developers this continues to be probably uh just it's a uh, tremendous need and it's uh it's one of those things where it's hard to find good mobile developers right so a lot of folks are starting to gain some experience and some expertise and some understanding of how mobile development works um, maybe some of you guys have started working with swift which is for ios uh, and it's going to eventually be for ios and mac and and other platforms as well uh, but uh there's a tremendous shortage of mobile developers um you know and uh so this would be uh this would be a law this would be basically a large um this would be basically designing software and coding software which is uh you know development work um which there's a tremendous need for just in general um i'm going to share a couple of stats with you towards the end as well that'll kind of give you an idea of, of the of the need that we have. Uh, machine learning continues to be just one of these, you know, uh, we hear about machine learning, but we, you know, a lot of folks are like, I think I kind of know what that is, but let's go back to the example of self-driving cars, right? Um, some of you guys may have done a CAPTCHA on Google recently, and it tells you to select every stop sign or every school bus or every crosswalk or traffic light. And what you're basically doing is actually through that system, you're improving Google's machines uh, that are designed for their self-driving cars. Um, and so what they're basically doing is they have just a gazillion hours of video and, and images of their cars driving around uh, all kinds of towns and cities and areas. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes they come across um, unidentifiable objects in their environment. And so what they do is they use our human minds to try to help them decipher what that is so that improves their algorithm over time. Um, and so eventually what will happen is if one car sees a particular kind of a stop sign and understands that that's a stop sign, or if one car is driving down the street and there's a pedestrian crossing the road, how does it analyze if that pedestrian is walking fast enough to cross the street or if the car needs to slow down or stop? Uh, and as that car learns that, then it shares it back into the cloud so that every other car using that same system also learns the same thing, right? So, uh, so for example, if a car comes to Tumor's Corner and says, oh, guys, it's normal that there's toilet paper hanging around here at certain times of the year, right? Then how does that information get shared to every other car system that's using the same technology 
so that when the next car comes up self-driving and sees toilet paper hanging from the um, from the trees and things like that, it doesn't freak out and doesn't know how to re react to that, right? So that's just one example. So as those machines or as those computer systems, information systems learn from their own existing information, that's called machine learning. And so training a system to know how to learn from itself is uh, is would be that area. So this is starting salaries are around 125 a year. It does require a little bit more expertise, a master's degree where you do some research around uh, machine learning to get really get into this field. The easily a huge growing area and just a tremendous need for talent in this area as well. Um, you guys may have heard of artificial intelligence, uh, AI. Uh, the idea here again is related to machine learning, but how do we build systems that are uh, capable of, of deciphering problems and, uh, and suggesting solutions. Uh, and so uh, this again is, you know, master's degree kind of work. So once you've gotten into the field, kind of feel, have a feel for what you want to be doing, then a master's degree would be an excellent option uh, to really expand your uh, earning potential as well as your career options. Um, so I want to get into what to study and let me share with you why I want to share with you what to study, okay? The, my one of my favorite stats that kind of freaks me out a little bit, but also just gives me a lot of hope for all of you is uh, in 2018, every single university in college in the United States combined graduated more computer science majors and 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 people with computer science uh, capabilities than ever before in our history. OK, and we graduated a total of about 68,000 people. OK, so about 68,000 people in 2018 graduated with a degree in computer science or a related field like software engineering, information systems management, those kinds of things. At that given time in 2018, there were over 500,000 jobs open for technology fields. OK. So even if we graduate, and that number is growing, right? There are so many jobs. For, so basically for every one person that we are able to graduate with a degree in computer science or software engineering or information systems management, there are 10 jobs open, right? Of all varying kinds. So think about the kinds of, you know, you guys may have had an economics class or something like that. Think about the opportunity that creates for people who have the talent, right? Uh, do you want to work from home? They're going to let you think about how to do that. Do you want to take a, a month off so you can backpack around Europe after you wrap up a major project? They're going to, you could probably negotiate for that. Do you want certain benefits that are kind of hard to find? They're probably going to, you know, so if we think about, if you think about the kinds of perks that you generally uh, may have read about at Silicon Valley companies, like dry cleaning is provided, or they have car services, or they have chefs that make gourmet meals for lunch, and now they're starting to make gourmet meals to deliver to homes because of the remote work uh, stuff going on. Those kinds of perks exist because there's such a dearth of available talented people. And so... Uh, even if even if you say, wow, what if I graduate in this and then are there going to be enough jobs for that? Yes, there is such a tremendous need for these jobs. Um, and what happens is, you know, companies like Facebook or like Amazon are these places that are hiring thousands and thousands of people every month. They don't want to go overseas. They don't want to like they they have a need. They have to have be able to hire talent. And so they have to go find wherever the talent is. Uh, and and so if we are able to graduate enough people with the talent, then they'll hire because they have a desire to hire people who are talented. Uh, and so that's, you know, every time you hear about uh, like jobs going to India or jobs going to China or jobs going to other parts of the world, um, it's not because they're it's not just because they're trying to cut their costs. It's because there's just such a shortage of talent that they're trying to find it wherever they can. And most of these companies are global companies and they need to be able to find talent all over the world. And so I, I would still encourage you to consider at least whatever you try to do. The advice I give to my children is you can be whatever you want and then you should also learn how to program a computer to do the same thing. Uh, and so something to consider from that perspective. 
Any questions about the careers that I've mentioned um, and what I've shared? I don't know if I can. Um, All sounds interesting so far. It's great, great information. Miss Marshall in the chat has put in a request for going ahead and sending some donations to Auburn High <laughs> for those in Ms. Decker's class. So just make sure you guys have seen that. Yeah, thanks for that plug there, Dr. Ali. <laughs> Okay. So uh, I want to talk a, a little bit about how to go about learning, uh, you know, or getting started with the, the kinds of things you should study or you could study uh, for these careers. Um, so something that's available to all of you for free is if you go to learn just coding basics. All right. If you go to code.org or Code Academy, some of those kinds of places that uh, that are online web based. Um, you can start doing some of these things, app labs, game labs, web labs. And basically what that does is starts building your skill a little bit in the problem solving that you need. Uh, if you've got younger siblings, you know, there's stuff for younger ages on there as well on these websites. I highly encourage you to see, you know, is it for you? Is this something that you would enjoy doing? Uh, you know, code.org is an excellent site to start on uh, to, uh, to get the feel for it. Um, oops, give me one second. There's always the traditional degree. So software engineering is a major on campus that we offer. Computer science is a major. There's also information systems management. That's the program that I teach in uh, currently while I, I do my administrative work and I also teach a class every semester just to, because I enjoy teach being yeah. able to teach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So a typical uh, college degree is is measured in credit hours is how that works, right? So you'll see something like a software engineering degree is 120 total credit hours, okay? And what happens is college degrees are basically a collection of courses that you're gonna have to take. And it's made up of what are called core courses. So everyone has to take these, right? No matter what your major is, you're gonna take two English courses, you know, a history and these, uh, math courses and those kinds of things. And uh, those typically add up to around 60 hours. So each class is typically around three credit hours, um, you know, around that time, around that. So just most classes are three credit hours. So when you see 60 credit hours, that's about 20 courses, right? So you take 20 courses uh, and that knocks out your core courses. And as you're, as you're kind of taking those core courses over time, that number goes down. And then over time, the number of courses that you're taking in your major will go up. And so engineering courses uh, will be things like fundamentals of computing or algorithms or operating systems, modeling and design, some of the, you know, and then certainly ethics is a big part of it as well. In information systems, you'll have courses like Intro to Python. I know some of you guys are in an Intro to Python class right now. There's an Intro to Python class that's taught at the 4,000 level, which means for juniors and seniors uh, on campus. Uh, in the College of Business uh, for information systems management, right? So the so you're on an excellent track to be ready uh, for a college degree like that. And essentially, what will happen is you have about 20 classes that you take in the major, right? And those 40 classes uh, combine, roughly 40 classes combine into 120 credit hours. And as soon as you knock out those 40 classes, you graduate with your bachelor's degree. And usually, the semester before you graduate. Uh, you, you know, you start interviewing for places. So about a year or two before, about a year before you graduate, you can start looking into options like co-op or uh, internships. Um, certainly internships can start a little bit earlier than that as well, but definitely by the, the summer, uh, you know, before your junior year is a good time to start internships uh, and then, or co-op options. Uh, and then, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and then the semester before you graduate, you start, um, kind of like if you think about the year before you graduate, you start looking at colleges and seeing where you want to apply. And maybe if you want to go to college and, and, you know, what are you looking for in a college? And so about a semester before you um, before you um, graduate, you start looking for and interviewing for jobs and, and, and applying for different jobs. Uh, the best advice I can tell you tell you for applying for jobs is uh, it's a it's a it's a also a numbers problem. Right. It's a numbers problem to solve. Uh, so if you apply for one job, then the probability of getting a job interview and a job offer is very low. Uh, but if you think about the fact that your your goal is to try to get maybe two offers, right? So you can pick a better one, or maybe you just want one offer and you just want to take one job. 
So in order to get that one job, maybe you need to have three interviews, okay? And if you're in order to get three interviews, maybe you need to apply for 30 jobs, right? And in order to, to apply for 30 jobs, maybe you need to look at about 120 jobs. So, so basically it all comes down to a funnel issue, right? And, and depending on how well you do, so if you have, instead of a 4.0 GPA, you have a three, let's see, I was doing a thumbs up. So I did the, anyway, that's kind of a fun feature for WebEx. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, if instead of a 4.0 GPA, you have maybe a 3.0 GPA. So that would mean instead of applying for 100 jobs, you're going to apply for 200 jobs, right? Like, so you just, that's how you adjust the numbers around based on uh, how competitive of a candidate you are. If you've uh, written a mobile app and published a mobile app and started, you know, making and, and have some kind of a document of how you've done some projects on your own like that, then instead of applying for 100 jobs, maybe you only need to apply for 40 jobs, right? Because you've got, you're, you're more competitive of a, as a candidate. So those are the things you want to think about as your um, professional, um, as, you, as you think about your professional goals and then your competitive advantage. Um, so uh, Amazon, like I mentioned, you know, there's just a tremendous need for cloud engineers from Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. Uh, and, uh, you know, I wouldn't be too concerned about picking one or another in terms of learning, because uh, if you are, if you feel comfortable and competent with uh, AWS or Amazon Web Services, uh, then uh, you'll, uh, you know, then this is actually like, you know, you'll be ready for, for picking up Microsoft Azure very easily, or even Google Cloud, you know, pretty straightforward. Uh, from there in terms of uh, the learning. And so I would suggest you just pick one and go with it. And to tell you a little bit about Amazon Web Services or AWS, you know, when we think of Amazon, we typically think of ordering stuff online and getting it in a, in a box to our door. Um, but Amazon doesn't really make money off of selling us stuff. Amazon actually makes uh, all of their profits, uh, just, well, let me say a vast majority of their profits are made off of uh, their cloud services so how well they manage all the data that they uh, need to track and and so they sell those services to companies that need to be able to store their own data and manage their own data um, in the cloud so this is a huge need and a huge growth area uh, for amazon because this is where they make their money um so Again, for those of you learning Python, huge because Python is the you know is still the backbone to a lot of these um, cloud services. So excellent choice on taking that class. Um, I do. I want to share with you this uh, website called the No Excuse List. I tried it a, a couple of weeks ago and it was still working, um, but I was kind of wonder if it's updated as much as it should be. Um, but the no no excuse list is basically what do you want to learn today, and it finds you places that teach online what you want to learn so this is an this is a way to learn lots of different things basically um and uh and you know it gives you sources of how to find uh find whatever it may be that you want to learn um so you know of course you know common sites like khan academy and 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 like i mentioned code.org and those kinds of places but you know there may be a coursera course that's you know that's available for you to take for free or something like that as well all those things are good and worth exploring um, so I want to talk with you a little bit about algorithms, right? So this idea of algorithms and, and people get scared about, oh, I don't know what an algorithm is. I don't know. It's just essentially the steps you take to solve a problem, right? And so for those of you who may have played a game of 20 questions. Now, Miss Marshall, do I have the ability to like ask them questions and for them to, to speak or? Yes, but we're, we've got Mrs. Decker, her students are in the room. Um, they would okay. be able to come up or type something in the chat, perhaps. Okay, so maybe we could use uh, chat, right? So say if we take uh, the game of 20 questions, right? Uh, so I'll say, I'll, I'll share with you that I'm thinking of uh, the name of a person, okay? And let's play 20 questions of how, if you can figure out the name of the person that I'm thinking of. So, uh, and if we're able to use chat, great. And if not, then I can kind of just walk through the activity instead. So what will be the, uh, yeah, exactly. See, the first question Ms. Marshall uh, posted is, is, is it a male or is it a female, right? So what we're doing is basically, if you think of, you, you know, you've got a, a mind of all of these possible potential options. And uh, and uh, I'm, I'm laughing because it says I raised my hand. I did technically, I guess, raise my hand. But um, 
So if you think about, um, you know, the game of 20 questions, right? You, you, you've got these world of possibilities. I just said to you, it's a person, you know, and then, and then you've got to start thinking about, okay, is it a male or a female? Because, you know, in our mind that splits it down in about 50, 50, right? And then we say, maybe the next question would be, are they alive or are they dead? Because that cuts it down another huge, right? So that process of, yep, are they famous? Uh, and so the answer is it's a female. No, it is not a male. And uh, are they famous? Yes, they are famous. Um, and so as we go through these questions, what happens is you're actually doing what's called a, uh, a sorting algorithm. Because in your mind, you're trying to sort through a list of bunch of options and try to identify the right option. And anytime you do, say, a search uh, online, or if you are looking for, uh, you know, the, the systems that are, if, if you search for a file on your computer, uh, how that computer looks for the file that you're looking for is basically uh, a sorting algorithm. And so your mind, every time you play 20 questions, you're already going through the, the necessary steps to play the same 20 questions game, essentially, right? The same sorting algorithm in your mind. Um, so I'm not sure if, if, if it would be a, a time, uh, I don't know if it could be a time efficient activity to go through and play it, play the game. Um, but I was thinking of Helen Keller. <laughs> my daughter had to write a, my daughter had to write a report on Helen Keller last week. So anyway, I figured I'd go with that. <laughs> um, and then, if, you know, if we think about, uh, so that was the sorting algorithm, right, that we did. So now I want to do uh, another activity, and it's called Let's Go Sightseeing, okay? I'm going to show you a map, okay? And what I'd like for you to do is on your, uh, on a sheet of paper, or on your mind, or however you want to do it, uh, go through uh, the activity, and I'll explain it in a bit as I show it to you, okay? So what we have is basically a a map that I'm showing you and I want you to figure out what route can you take such that you leave from the hotel and you visit every site but only once and you end up back at the hotel. Okay, so I'm going to give you a, a minute or two to, to go through it. <laughs> So there's no one answer. I mean, there are a couple of different answers, but I want to show you. So, you know, for example, one possible answer uh, <laughs> may have been uh, hotel to the science. So one possible answer could be you go around the outside first, right? You go around the hotel to the science museum, to the toy shop, to the big wheel, to the park, to the zoo. And then you go around the inside, aquarium, art gallery, waxworks, worship, castle, cathedral, and then you're back at the hotel. So we didn't go to any one location more than once, and we were able to go to all of them. Now, there are wrong answers also, right? So if I would have gone to the zoo first, then I'm kind of trapping myself in because, you know, I'm not able to go to all of the sites in a, you know, it, it becomes a little bit more challenging. I got to like bounce around maybe this way, this way, this way and then up to Waxworks, and then I go back around the inside and then go back up to. So yeah, there are multiple answers, right? But what this is, is basically a tree traversal, right? And that is a very common kind of an algorithm solution as well. If you think about having to find uh, data, having to find the shortest route, having to find all of those kinds of things, uh, like paths and, and solutions, those are called tree traversal uh, algorithms, which, you know, if you were going to write a program on what's the most efficient route, then all of a sudden you start having to create a way of how do you measure, right? So 
is the distance from the hotel to the zoo longer than the distance from the hotel to the science museum? And so how do you measure which route you're taking? Um, and, uh, and those, you know, and, and so then you start having to find optimization and those kinds of things. So, you know, there's, this is just one, one possible way of doing an algorithm uh, and a tree traversal algorithm, right? And then they become more complicated as a result. So think about when you uh, open up your web browser and you type in a web address, okay? Let's say you're gonna type in google.com. Now, Google is based out of California, but they have google.com servers all over the world, right? So how does your, say your phone or your secret device that no one knows that you have at school, uh, how does that device know which google.com server to go to to show you the results, right? It could say, well, I guess I'll take a 3,000 mile trip all the way out to the California servers, but they probably don't even have servers in California because the power is too expensive. Maybe they've got servers closer to north of Atlanta, right? Near Dalton or something like that, where the power is not as expensive or in Chattanooga. And so uh, is, that, is that a faster route for your phone to pull up that website? And, and those, the route that, that, uh, uh, the, you know, the route that those, um, uh, that that compute that your device takes in order to pull up your web page is going to determine uh, how efficiently that website is able to load. Think about if you, every time you went to Bing, right, to do a search, it took 10 seconds to load the page, you would stop going to Bing because, and so that's the cost for their programmers and their network engineers to create a more efficient tree traversal algorithm for their code. Any questions about the two activities we did? Ms. Decker, any of your students have questions? So uh, I want to share one more information, piece of information with you, and this is about how to get a head start on your uh, on, on getting started for college. So Auburn University has a program that we call Auburn First. Some of you guys may be familiar with it already, uh, but essentially it's a dual enrollment um, program, and you can take Auburn University classes at a steep discount. I'm talking like 500 bucks for a class. Uh, and uh, we've got, uh, so that program is administered out of my area. Uh, and, and, uh, and basically you're able to take classes online. Uh, so you could be, you know, you could take an English class and that knocks out your English credits. Remember we talked about the core courses. So you could, you know, we've got English classes, we've got math classes, we've got um, a couple of science classes, we've got, you know, a few elective classes, we've got foreign languages, um, all different kinds of classes are available online to take towards the uh, towards the Auburn First Dual Enrollment Program. And for most of the classes, if you take them uh, at the university, uh, then it also counts for high school credit. And so it's not like you're having to take the class twice. You can have it count towards your high school credit as well. And it counts towards your Auburn, uh, it counts towards your degree. Uh, and if you go to Auburn, it makes it super easy because you've got a head start on completing college. But even if you decide, say you got a full scholarship to go to you know, another university and you want to go there instead, then those credits that you earn at Auburn would transfer to whatever university you want to go to, uh, you know, any accredited university you want to go to in, in the country. Uh, and so you would have an Auburn transcript that you would transfer to that, institu that institution. Essentially, it's if you take AP classes, it's similar to that, except you're taking the class on campus and there's no big test at the end. It's just whatever the test would be for that class. Any questions about the Auburn First program? So I've got the URL for uh, for the Auburn First program. Uh, it's aub.ie uh, slash aufirst. And you can uh, get a little bit more information about that program. <laughs> 